Good morning. Hi, everybody. Just got my questions over here. So how many of you guys, I can't actually see you, uh, have actually played Magic the Gathering or seen, or seen somebody? Wow, that's a lot of people. That's like half the room. Um, OK. That's what we like to see. That's awesome. <laughs> right. So Magic uh, came out in 1993. Uh, I discovered it at our local hobby shop playing D&D, &D, uh, which everybody stopped playing once Magic came into the scene uh, and completely took over. It's been 24 years uh, since its release. And I think it's eight years of consecutive growth and has hit its all-time high in sales, which is absolutely incredible. Um, I know you guys are wondering, why are we talking about Magic and set up a Magic tournament and happened to rig it and win it, and now he's got Magic on stage. He's obviously taking his passion too far. Uh, but it's all about the Academy and what the Academy stands for. Uh, we we want to celebrate and elevate the craft, and I think there's some amazing things to learn uh, from a game that has so much history and such a vibrant community. Um, we're not going to talk a lot about the mechanics today. We're actually, this year's theme is world builders. Uh, so we have Jeremy and Doug here uh, who lead that uh, over at Wizards. So do you guys want to introduce yourselves? Uh, sure. I'm Doug Beyer. I, uh, I've worked at Wizards of the Coast for 17 years now, and I am currently a senior game designer and writer for the Magic R&D creative team. My name is Jeremy Jarvis. I am currently the principal designer of Worlds and IP. Uh, my background is in freelance illustration. Uh, I was hired as lead concept artist, moved to senior art director, served that role for just shy of a decade uh, before taking this new position. Can you guys give us some uh, stats for background on Magic? Uh, Magic's, uh, as you said, been around for 24 years. It's been played by millions and millions of players. Um, the, like, like you said, we've ha a lot of people have thought that uh, Magic was a fad, but this is actually our biggest year ever. This, this is the time when Magic's at its apex right now. So we're seeing enormous growth. That's incredible. We also uh, we print Magic in 11 languages, and it is sold in more than 70 regions around the world. So yeah. it is a very global game. It's also known for its events. I think you were telling me backstage that you guys run a, a million events a year, which is pretty insane. Yep, uh, we have a million events reported uh, a year. We continue to add to that in that global organized play network. Okay, so all the boring stuff is out of the way. Can you, <laughs> can you guys describe the game for us? What, what is the game and what is the fantasy of Magic the Gathering? So the metaphor of uh, Magic is that two dueling mages come together and use their in uh, ingenuity, their spells, their creatures uh, to duke it out. Um, it takes place across multiple worlds, which is part of why we're here talking to you now, uh, because a huge part of magic is these uh, different realms that these dueling wizards get their, gets their magic from. And then, and then what about the role of the different pieces of that? So you've got the planeswalkers, uh, you have the world itself, uh, you got the spory and you got the spells and the creatures. How did those all come together? And the colors. That's right. So uh, players identify with the five colors of magic. They choose their favorite and build around it or build with multiple colors. And then we have Planeswalker characters. Planeswalkers move from world to world. They're sort of the, the main feature of magic as we move across every different kind of world. And they learn these different spells and, and creatures as they, on their travels and use that in battle. And why, why are those important? Because I don't remember them being there when I was playing earlier on. Maybe they were always there. But what, what is the role of the Planeswalker? It, it's changed over time. Like, it's always been a part of the IP. Originally, the concept of the player being a Planeswalker was more or less to explain why you continue to, uh, to customize your deck with new cards from new places. Um, we elaborated on that in early fiction, having these very powerful uh, godlike mages um, that are able to move between these places, kind of feature largely in the fiction. Um, in 2002, with Mirrodin, we adopted kind of what we informally call the Star Trek model of actually every year's product release moved to a new world. Uh, we started building a new world, a new plane within the, the Magic Multiverse 
every year. In 2007, we actually introduced Planeswalkers as a card type in the game um, to give us faces and stories and arcs to follow between those places. Um, and now we are actually <laughs> building two worlds a year. Uh, as magic moves from place to place, we have doubled that effort. Um, and you can see the, the fruits of that result uh, on the, the, the screens behind us as a kind of random sampling of our different places, our different characters that players follow between them. And what, what, what makes a Planeswalker special? So the, in a way, the worlds of magic are, are what gives it its diversity, what gives it its freshness every year, um, and now every six months. <laughs> uh, planeswalkers are the, the touch point. They're what you can recognize it and grab onto you. I, I'm excited by this. Uh, Chandra uh, makes me happy, or Liliana. And the adventures of that planeswalker will, will follow uh, throughout the IP as we go from world to world. So they're able to, um, their, your, their unique power is to be able to uh, planeswalk between these different planes and gather magic and therefore be the kind of heroes of the game. Even in a world where there's plenty of magic, these planeswalkers are the, the, the mages of mages. And it, it, would you say that that's something that may have enabled narrative for the game more strongly? Yeah, so once we had, like Jeremy said in 2007, introduced planeswalkers as a card type within the game, that made it so much more real to players. They can uh, own this character, they can, they can focus on them, and that gave us the opportunity to build uh, more narrative around these characters. So now we don't just hear about what, is, uh, what big conflict is going on in this setting that we're, we're focusing on for six months, but also what's going on in Chandra's life? How is she growing and evolving over time? How are the events of what's, what you see in the card set affecting these characters and creating a continuous narrative? And so, and how are the stories told on the cards? Is it just on the cards that the story is told or is the narrative taken in other places? I, I've been enjoying hearing some of the other talks talk about how you know, we only have a AAA video game and it's hard to tell stories in that medium. <laughs> Our medium is this big. And non-sequential. Right, and it's shuffled. <laughs> so it's a challenge to tell stories in this medium. So uh, we do infuse the cards and the settings with as much of the feel of a world as possible. Like all, all the limitations that that card size gives us makes it so much more important to have the feel of depth. Mm -hmm. The feel that there's this entire world going on that we're just seeing little pieces of through the cards. That is also supported uh, currently with weekly web fiction. Um, it's something that I, I don't think a lot of other people are doing. Um, we think about stories as kind of levels or rings of engagement. Um, the the non-sequential card game is only going to give you that very top touch point. Um, and we game that as best we can within our randomized booster packs um, we have story spotlights, cards that are very story relevant, that uh, really capture a moment in time that we want players to know, a watermark and a URL printed on the card paths you to that weekly fiction. Um, beyond that, our rarity structure is common, uncommon, rare, and then mythic rare. Uh, one of the things we've recently started doing is, uh, I call it the Kerm model, common, uncommon, rare, mythic. Um, uh, using uh, uh, that rarity structure to try to tell the most people most of the time the things they need to know first. Um, for example, Planeswalker characters, the actual cards, are mythic rares. They're very good cards, very powerful, seen pretty infrequently if you're just cracking boosters. So we find a venue at Common, who, which you're going to see very frequently, just to show the character, right? So that first takeaway is like, oh, Jace is here. We just show him doing some random thing. At Uncommon, what's the next thing I need to know? Oh, well, Jace and this other character really hate each other, and so on. So that as people crack boosters, they're kind of learning as they go. And, and this is the kind of technique that we've evolved and iterated on over years. Yes. Part of magic's strength is that, I mean, we, my career has grown with magic. We, Jeremy and I have worked together for 11 years just on the same, the same focal team. And so we've found these techniques to use the structure of the game itself to help deliver a kind of sequentiality in a shuffled medium. And there is a lot of structure to the game too. Like even in terms of the colors, they all mean different things as well, right? Certain colors have different 
types of characteristics in? Right, each color has its own ethos, and it's, it has both uh, sort of showy values, like red is about fire and dragons, it also has personal values. Uh, red is about rebellion and, and independence and freedom. So each of these colors uh, is built into the design of the game, and it's, it's hooked into the mechanics, but it also creates a foundation for character, for story, for, I mean, we just love putting Jason Chandra in a room together, a blue mage and a red mage. They're opposite on their color pie, and they're opposite in, in story. In, in, they create instant great conflict. And, and was, it, was this always important? I know it was an iterative process, but I remember when I was playing as a kid, the stories weren't important to me back then. It was the individual cards like Shiv and Dragon or Sarah Angel, this is so rad, and then you crack another pack. And, and then you would go to different places like Arabian Nights and Ice Age, and that was all cool and very distinct, but I didn't remember the story part. And so, so that's actually, Shiv and Dragon is a really interesting example because like, as we talk about those levels of engagement, uh, especially through the, the lens of story, um, uh, the narrative is a level down, right? If you're actually going to um, our website every week to really read uh, the prose and the dialogue and what's happening. But a good example of very top level story is just the use of proper nouns to imply a world beyond, right? Like Shiv and Dragon could have just been fire breathing dragon, but we, it was given a proper name. And later, Shiv was built into a place and events happened at Shiv. And so it's just about where those touch points are um, we believe that the story is very important, um, not only because people want to engage, whether it's the desire to know, like what is Shiv about, how is this special, um, but, but primarily when you release um, so much product over such a long time period, um, it, it, it helps give personality identity and purpose. It makes it a, you know, just like there's a story arc, it gives it a product arc, so it's not just more and more and more. Um, and so that is the real value of, uh, you know, characters with faces and backstories and personalities to propel you to the next setting, to the next product. Yeah. So, I mean, the story part is what really surprised me coming back as a player because I would be at a hobby store and I'd be playing the game, and there's two kids or two dudes or whatever players that are talking about uh, the narrative and, and, and the planeswalkers and what's going on. Recently, I think there was Soren, and he had to undo a creation of his, which was Avacyn, and you hear these guys talking about it, and you're like, oh, there's really a story here. And then Zendikar, I think you guys, if you could talk about Battle for Zendikar and how that actually really, I saw it physically happen at a GP where <laughs> the Eldrazi, these giant creatures came and literally took over. Right, so uh, Zendikar was a setting from several years back now, and it was full of promise. This is kind of like high adventure world with uh, adventurers and explorers, and the threat looming in the world of Zendikar were these cosmic entities, the Eldrazi. So the Eldrazi show up and start taking over, and the last time we visited Zendikar, that was the end of the story. The Rise of the Eldrazi was the name of the set, and they rose, and we turned the camera away from Zendikar. So there was, there, was a, there was a battle still to happen there that we wanted to come back to and, and resume and see the end of. So um, we returned to Zendikar, and now we focused on like, okay, we're gonna build a magic set that's based around finally having this conflict between the denizens of Zendikar and the Eldrazi. What, how, how do we bake that into both the story and the, and the uh, mechanics, but also the characters. We, we had our, our cast of Planeswalker characters come to Zendikar, come to the aid of this world, this beautiful adventure world, and fight back these uh, alien entities. And that's, you can see that in the mechanics when you draft uh, Battle for Zendikar. You, you can kind of choose a side. You, you can focus mostly on Eldrazi mechanics or on uh, the side of the adventurers. And so that's indicative of the kinds of ways that we use setting and uh, story and creative to build what would have been a more dry mechanical experience. Yeah. And, and not only that, but uh, it allows us to deliver on player expectation, right? They know the state of the world where we left Rise of the Eldrazi. Um, going back to Zendikar, there was the expectation that the story would continue from there. Like we don't go back and there's just no Eldrazi, like we kind of made a promise, but also, 
we needed to deliver on the expectations of the original first Zendikar setting, right? Uh, there was still landfall, there were allies, and so it's this kind of balancing act um, to not only acknowledge player expectation, but to really make them happy, to really work within that space and give them what we believe they are anticipating and really wanting. Yeah. And I, I, what was amazing for me was just how physical it felt when the Eldrazi actually took the Pro Tour, like every deck in the meta was basically Eldrazi, and it was, it was putting in, in real life what the story was, which the players were super happy about. Um, can you guys talk a bit about the creative process? How is Magic made? What is the team like, and how, how far do you look ahead? And... So uh, we both work in R&D for Magic, and that's a group of about 50 people. And uh, our section of it is the creative team that focuses on the, the art, the story, the, the world, the flavor. Um, and there's design teams for each, for each Magic set that have representatives from uh, creative on our side, um, design and development that focus on the vision for the, the mechanics and how the gameplay is going to work. And we, we, we ship, magic ships. <laughs> uh, we've had continuous products every year for 24 years. So it, we've, we have a very tight pipeline of content, essentially, of, of different kinds of gameplay that's always going on. Right, just let me jump in really quick. That, that worldwide organized play network, like we are working backwards from simultaneous global release and working backwards from that from the amount of time it takes to localize into those non those other 10 non-English languages working back from that you know it is very inflexible because for organized play tournament organizers have rented venues years in advance like we do not get to slip by a day um, and, and that is you know when Doug says we ship that's why so um, the creative process is uh, working within that in, uh, enormous uh, pipeline. So we have tons of interaction back and forth between the folks working on the mechanics and the gameplay uh, and what the story and the world is going to be. So there's, there's a tight interaction there. Some worlds uh, are sort of more mechanics first that, that we think of as bottom up, that here's a, here's a cool mechanic, it's just really fun, like everyone's gravitating to doing this one kind of mechanic and we're like, okay, well, what, what's a, a world that clothes that, that makes that make sense? And sometimes it's more like, uh, let's take Greek mythology as an inspiration, and we're going to uh, build a world around that, and then the designers are gonna, you know, what, what can they uh, find that will deliver mechanically that same feel? Hmm. So how many, what, are, what, what is the ship's schedule like? You guys ship, but how often do you ship? Like how many? There's Worldwide a, drops are there? There's a major release every three months, and there are minor releases just about every month, uh, forever. And, and, how, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and how many cards have actually been made in Magic? Uh, over sixteen thousand mechanically unique cards. Wow. And if you want a job at Wizard of the Coast, you have to just be able to name them all. Yeah, you have to just know them. <laughs> Not really. It used so, to be true. So many cards, you just throw two random names and it's probably a card, right? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, and that's an interesting point. I mean, think about being in the 24th season of a TV show. Uh, the, you know, think about The Simpsons trying to, like, what has Bart not done yet? That sort of thing. So we have to work with tons of talented people to have a constant stream of great ideas of what's going to be resonant, what's going to be exciting, what doesn't step on the toes of something we've already done. And um, I mean, we're always looking at what makes the next release feel different and fresh compared to the previous release. How, how do you guys do that? We, we, first of all, we have learned to be protective and covetous of, of the, the space we have. And I mean that both literally and figuratively. Like, there are some great mechanics that are too verbose to fit on the cards, right? Cards are made of millimeters, and we're not gonna fix that. Um, and as long as we are printing, those millimeters are a fixed and known quantity. And it's not just the mechanic link in English, what happens in German? So, you know, we'll talk about constraints coming up a little bit. There's a little taste of constraints. Um, we do that in the creative space as well. Of uh, An example is, you know, there were, if we know that coming up, we're going to need a certain visual motif or a certain narrative motif, we will kind of carve that space out for ourselves and throw a long pass to future us of like, don't use, don't use feathers here, we're gonna need that in this upcoming guild or whatever it is. 
Um, and so we have, you know, we not only need to stay off of the last thing, again, because we especially going to two worlds a year, we need to get players twice as excited twice as often. We really need to feel fresh in the difference between um, Battle for Zendikar and then the dark tone and mood of Innistrad and then optimistic uh, inventor Kaladesh and then what's going to happen in Amonkhet. Uh, and so we are trying to swing that pendulum to keep things fresh and exciting and we've learned to get really stingy with the space that we have and plan it out pretty meticulously. I remember asking uh, name and flavor text writers not to use the word bridge on a card because I knew Return to Ravnica was coming up. Like literally we were holding on to urban sounding words, city words, because we we're going to go to a city world and I you know, didn't want to spend that ahead of time if we knew we were going to get more bang out of it in, in an upcoming world. I mean, it seems like there's really high intention, but there's also the deadline. Yeah. So what, what happened? I mean, there, sometimes things must, there must be mistakes. Uh, our, I mean, our... Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Funny you should mention that we just never have... Yeah, it hasn't mistakes. come up. I don't know what your... Next, go. next question. Um, I mean, there's an incredible pressure on making a fun game on a time limit. I mean, that's, that's always been true. Uh, we have very talented folks working on this all the time, who ha have contacts with, with our players all, all over the place. So um, things slip through. It's just the way it is. There's, uh, we, we always talk about how the, the player base outnumbers us by a factor of a million or something. So they're going to find connections and combos and cards that we weren't able with our resources internally to, to map every version of. You know, they find the version of a deck that is more degenerate than we had enough time to, to discover and, and prevent. Yeah, it turns out gamers will game. That's true. They will find the exploits. It's true. <laughs> uh, on the creative end, I, I think we're lucky in that we get to work uh, pretty far ahead most of the time. We're not making last minute changes to worlds the same way that last minute changes might happen to mana costs or power and toughness oh. to make sure you know, things like that come through. I mean, there's, there's late art pieces for sure. Yep. There's snafus of various ways in any kind of work yeah. pipeline. Well, that, that, yeah, I was going to that. So on the art side, what, what is that pipeline like? The, the art of magic has gotten really good over the years. What, what's been driving that? So what's been, <laughs> uh, what's been driving that is, so far as aesthetically, um, the desire to, again, really make these, you know, we talk about magic visuals as immersive. That's probably funny to a lot of you that actually get to make more immersive experiences. But for that postage stamp we get, we are, we are doing our damnedest to really sell that this is a place and a time with a feeling and a conflict and there are characters and they are real and they function within this and they interact in interesting ways. And so, uh, you know, that is the talent that we pursue um, and it is, it is all outsourced. Uh, I have two internal concept artists who are excellent, and then the rest of all of Magic Art, and we currently commission between 14 and 1,600 pieces of world-class fantasy art a year. Um, it, that is all outsourced to a global uh, talent pool. And what we're looking for in that talent pool is the ability to make people believe in these places and in these characters. Um, so far as uh, to elaborate on how our internal process works against that deadline, one of the things we've iterated on through the years and gotten pretty good at is learning what we're going to need, like we are setting ourselves up for success. If we're doing our jobs correctly, there are going to be X number of cards. A world guide needs to have enough content and depth and richness and uh, illustrations to populate uh, 450 or so cards in that block. Um, and so we phase our, our own work um, so to get us to the next milestone that sets us up for success with the next milestone that sets us ourselves up for success. <laughs> and uh, we've just iterated on that. And, you know, I, when something clunks or is suboptimal, uh, we change the process. I am one of those people who firmly believes that all process, especially great process, is versus something. And sometimes it's versus a person. But anyway, <laughs> all great process is, <laughs> is versus something and, and you know, an outcome that you're tired of seeing. And so we will change our process. We will re rephase our work. Uh, we will add an artist to 
the concept push, uh, uh, to Doug's point, we've had lots and lots of reps in making magic sets, and while we don't get to move the date, and we don't get to soft patch, we do get to learn iteratively in basically a three month cycle. Well, yeah, the game's now been out for 24 years and there's been so much evolution on it. I the think game now is old enough to drink. It's, old, <laughs> it's not older than the Academy, celebrating its 20th year. But I think we're now at a point where we're witness, witnessing games that have this kind of generational uh, lifetime, like over a decade. I remember when I was working at Nexon in the 2000s and our games came out, it was like, oh, how much longer is it gonna last? Wow, it's not running for two years. Oh, now it's running for three years. What else do we have to put? We just didn't know when the end would be. It's like, oh crap, now it's out for 10 years. Uh, League of Legends, I think, is an amazing example of that. When the game first came out, I know a lot of people didn't play it because they couldn't get past the art. And now it looks freaking amazing. Yep. The splash art is absolutely insane. Um, and, and the in-game art is insane, too. But Brandon told me about this story around uh, some of the art. The players really love some of the older art for their own personal reasons, the super derpy art. Um, and I think whether it's process or, or things in the game, so, Players and developers have their sacred cows that might get in the way of progress. Can you speak to that? For sure. So, you know, at a very, at a very high level, when I started back in 2005, there was an attitude, it was unspoken, it certainly wasn't formal, but there was this attitude that like, magic is a card game. We make a card game. Uh, we know who it's for. We know who's playing it. Resign yourselves. Resign yourselves and make those people happy with the game you make. So inspiring. It wasn't, <laughs> wasn't it? To the point where it was actually verbalized that like, we don't even need art on these cards. Like, just put the math on the card, the cardboard sells itself. Which is, that's pretty difficult to swallow if you're the art guy. Um, <laughs> the warm fuzzies did not abound. <laughs> um, we do not believe that. We don't believe that. We believe that there are uh, opportunities for growth. We are in now, at this, uh, to your earlier point, we are seeing intergenerational um, attendance, parents bringing children uh, to the GPs, those children starting to grow up. Um, it's exciting, and there is so much potential trapped in that card that uh, we have been working for years to grow into an IP beyond only the game. And don't get me wrong, it's a great game that we love a lot or we would not work so hard on it. But it is time to start expanding that and, uh, and growing that IP. And we also believe that there are people that have the brains to be magic players that don't yet know the game is for them. We do not accept that we have a limited audience and we do not accept that we have a limited venue. Um, my core metric just personally, for whether or not a world guide is good, even though currently it is going to be expressed as 450 cards, is would I spend 90 minutes walking around this world, watching other people walk around it? Is this movie quality? Um, and so we have kind of uh, given ourselves higher expectations and demands and mandates so that we have this incredible back catalog of art and world and character uh, ready to be celebrated and exploited in new venues. So the, the world guide that Jeremy's talking about is uh, the, the end result of our uh, concept push process. So we get uh, the seed of an idea of a, of a new world, either in collaboration with uh, designers or, or you know, some idea that we're pursuing ourselves, and build on that and build on that, uh, assemble that into a, uh, a core statement of what this world's about, and then we get amazing talent in. We get uh, concept illustrators in who will take this uh, this laundry list of of IOUs, this this you know ambitious idea, and give us just illustration after illustration of this world. Then that you know that process gets winnowed down, and um, that then there's like thousands and thousands of words of lore and and story and world building text that's written by internal writers, and that becomes this document, this world guide, and it it's so cool, you guys, <laughs> like. Part of the... It's so cool you will never ever see one. <laughs> they're, all, they're also, you have to sign a whole bunch of things in order to see one. <laughs> I, want, I want to see one. I have to see one. You, 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 <laughs> nope. Sorry. <laughs> but that's, 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 the, that's the, the Bible that underlies everything that's going on world building wise for, um, for that setting. 
And so the process from there is once the card set is ready, the, uh, the, the mechanics are laid down, the gameplay is figured out, and roughly speaking, the, the, the cards have mana cost, they're, they have, they're color assigned, but they, they don't have a concept yet. It's, you know, this is just a bundle of mechanics. And the next step then is to, uh, for our team to write concepts, like little stories about each card almost that describe to the potential artist, what is this thing? You know, is this a, uh, a flying drake? Is this um, some kind of mage who's learned how to fly? Is this, you know, there's many options for any given set of statistics, uh, but that's when the kind of rubber meets the road. That's where the mechanics and the, the world actually meet. And then that's when uh, uh, the, the art directors commission out these uh, concepts to our huge pool of talent around the world, and we start seeing the art come in. That's super exciting. We can see the sketch stage come in first, and it's like, okay, you know, either, you know, maybe we want to tweak a couple things about it, or it looks like it has flying, but it doesn't really have flying on the text, so can we ask the artist to kind of mitigate that look or whatever? And then the final art comes in, and it gets married with the card, and that's when it becomes, you know, then it's reflecting the, the, the world building behind it. it it's, it's part of that setting. How far do you guys look out? What's that? How far do you guys plan for with this process? Just about every set it goes through at least two years of work, but we have plans for chronology of sets that go out, I think the farthest out we have right now is something like 2022. Uh, 2020 right now and uh, next month we start working oh, okay. next. the next two or three years. I'll clear my schedule. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh yeah, by the way, I'm gonna set up a bunch of meetings. Okay, um, <laughs> can we just like s figure out our outlook right here while we're on stage? <laughs> I have to make sure I can make that. I mean, it's really interesting because I remember you know, working on our games, we wouldn't look past like a year because we just didn't know. And now that it's a, if it, you're in a 10 year game, you know you're gonna keep it going for longer. You're basically what was one of Wizards uh, value stewards Right, stewardship is, is, a, is a huge part of it. And one of the earlier talks talking about this uh, with Halo as well, I mean, there's a responsibility to the players who've been with this game for so long that you have to treat it with the same respect and the same honor uh, that, that you know, connects with their uh, devotion to this game. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's not only that, like that is certainly true, but we are creating play environments with multiple settings in them. Um, we have what we call arc planning, which is what we were just alluding to, where we talk about what the next lineup of settings are going to be, what the narrative line is that takes you between those settings. The real goal of arc planning is to design a great standard environment. Like where we don't want to find ourselves is we make this really incredible setting and we go to make the next one and once it's time to start thinking about it, we're like, oh God, we can't, we can't do any of the things we want to do now because we were short-sighted. And so planning um, not only set to set and arc to arc, we, we are trying to create um, healthy environments that represent a period of time. And so we have to think in longer periods of time. Right, I mean, think, think about designing, making chess fun if it had 16,000 different pieces. <laughs> like like that's, that's the kind of work it takes to make sure that the, uh, that, that's part of the stewardship, is looking at if we introduce this new, this new mechanic or this new theme or this new uh, world, is it going to interact well and stay fun with the other thousands of magic cards that players already own? So Jeff Kaplan yesterday had a really great talk and he was talking about the maps of Overwatch and the intention that they put on it. They wanted to create an optimistic, really positive feeling world. But they also wanted to take players places uh, and they took inspiration from great vacation spots. Um, where do you guys take inspiration from? How do you draw, where do you draw from to take players to different places? Um, everywhere we possibly can. <laughs> Some of it's our own desires as fans of not only magic, but other properties. Um, Theros on the screen behind us uh, uh, is an example of how we will you know, we, what we call trope clusters, where there are rich genre centers or trope clusters. Um, yeah, let's do Magic Does Greek Mythology. Um, there are other times where the inspiration is what we call bottom-up, meaning there is a mechanical desire. Um, one of the game designers has a great idea, and we need to figure out what best skins that. A very loud example of that, for those of you familiar with Magic, is Ravnica. Right? Ravnica's elevator pitch was not, let's do medieval Prague guild city world. 
it was, that's not even a very good elevator pitch. <laughs> it, it was, hey, it. Tim <laughs> two-colored groups. What setting would best represent Tim to, Tim two-colored groups? And, uh, and then we solved that from the bottom up so that to the end user, these things are just the same. Of course, Ravnica just means two-colored guilds. Um, and of course, Theros just means enchantment matters and monstrous and gods, heroes, and monsters. Um, but yeah, we will, we will take inspiration from so any, anywhere available. What are worlds that you guys have kind of explored and gotten really far on and potentially just decided this is not right for magic? What places don't you go? There's, uh, during a, every time we do a, co a concept push, when we have those concept illustrators in, there end up being two or three ideas that are like, that's cool, but that's not here. Mm -hmm. That's not this world, it doesn't fit here, but man, we should save it because we're gonna have releases forever, so <laughs> let's, but you know, no good idea uh, goes, is wasted. It's just a matter of like, it might have to wait a decade <laughs> for, it to, for it to come to light. And it took a long time for, for you know, Magic had, before the first Innistrad, Magic I think had like two werewolf cards or something like that, which is kind of amazing. Like, it's kind of a basic trope of, of gothic horror, the werewolf and the idea that it you know, has two states and, and you know, wolfs out, but that just hadn't been explored and it was part of the power of Innistrad that was like, let's, let's find those places that just magic has not touched yet and, and go deep into them. And you know, so whenever there's an idea like that that just hits the cutting room floor, it's not, you know, we scoop it back up off the floor, you know, you know and it might seed another whole idea for a future world. Right. We have also gotten pretty good at uh, spidey sensing when a premise is not appropriate for us or will not scale, like there's not enough content here to make 450 cards. Well, okay, if it's still good, we'll find something else and do a mashup. Um, or some entire world premises just don't work for our game. Like because of the five colors, because of the game's resource system, which is five basic land types, if we can't get five basic land types out of a world concept, Magic can't do that world, or we have to find a really unique and interesting twist on it, and then you get into the conversation about how interesting and great are not always the same thing. <laughs> and so then we have to watch that. Um, but we're pretty good at not pursuing something too long and then being like, you know what? This was, this was never gonna work, was it? It's like, nope, I don't know, anyway. This world can't have a swamp, uh-oh. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. That seems like a problem. <laughs> So we're almost out of time. I really want to touch on this topic of constraints. We decided to call the talk Windows into Worlds, which I felt was very right for what you guys have. Uh, but you've created really big worlds and um, amazing characters. How do you guys embrace those constraints? What are the challenges with it and what have they enabled? I'll tell you the most important secret to working within constraints, especially when you are ambitious and put a lot of pressure on yourself to deliver. Get through the stages of grief and get to acceptance as soon as you possibly can. <laughs> and then once you're in acceptance, learn to game the space you have. Learn to game those millimeters. That is the very top line answer. Yeah, part of, part of what we've learned over time is maximizing the, the art box. Mm -hmm. So there are kinds of art that don't work. I feel like I'm answering all the art questions and the art, the, uh, art questions, <laughs> answering all the story questions. It works for me because I've learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> And here's how I do Jeremy's job. So uh, maximizing that space to make sure uh, a piece of art is effective when it's just over two inches wide. Um, so we've learned the techniques of focusing on a very few number of, of figures in that piece of art. You know, we don't have a gigantic, um, we don't have like a DM screen where a giant uh, scene can happen. We've got one tight image and you want to be able to recognize it quickly. I mean, that's useful for gameplay, right? You want to be able to understand which card uh, someone just played by the art, ideally. Um, so yeah, we've, we've been able to, uh, I mean, just again, iterating, we, we've, we've, there are 16,000 different mechanically distinct cards, and there are that many different pieces of magic art. So we've seen what works and what doesn't in that venue. Well, even, even with the art, um, not just based on the size, but the production of it, you guys are under an immense time pressure to generate all these cards, and you, you kind of send them your message in a bottle and they receive it and they come out with this art, you must give them a lot of freedom to come up with their art, right? Part of, part of our best practices are to really treat 
that global illustration pipeline, not as contractors, but as partners, because we need them you know, really wanting to do their best work for us. We like to build relationships with them. Those are the people we bring in for the concept push um, that gets us to the world guide, that allows us to outsource all of that artwork to that global talent pool. So it's this little machine that kind of doubles back on itself. But uh, we really do, I believe, the, the, the better part of art direction is knowing when to shut up. Like, we try to be a good client, and if it works, even if it's not what I would have done, every decision by decision, if it's great, leave it alone. And, uh, you know, that is why if the world guide is successful, that really is our last milestone. We have either set ourselves up for success or we have not. If that world guide is good and communicating well and full of rich, exciting content, the illustrators will just get it and they will play within that sandbox, and it will look like it was orchestrated in-house, even though you know, there are people that I have commissioned hundreds of pieces of art to um, for a decade and never met, right? Um, and we have a great relationship, and I love them, and they do great work, and we try to be a great partner and give them as much freedom as possible. That's awesome. It should always be like that. Do you guys, uh, does everybody at Wizards or within the Magic team play a lot of Magic? Or are you guys all passionate about the product? Tons of people play at work. I mean, I, I have to make, t I have to leave work during my commander game in order to get home and play with my, my casual group. And then I have to, like, I have a different group of pals that we play on Sundays. And then we come in on Monday and start making Magic. Again. I, I so asked that because I know with the, the Riot guys, they're really passionate about League. You, know, you see Brandon, you go to his house and you're hanging out. or you're at a bar, it's like, do you want to go back to my house and play League? <laughs> All the time. And I think the fans can feel it when the creators are passionate about the products that they're making, and I can, I can feel that from with, you guys. With the kind of sprawl that is Magic's content and history, it is really hard to be effective as an employee working on Magic if you don't A, know it pretty well, and B, love it a lot. Um, often in hiring, we will get into a conundrum where it's like, uh, we need a data scientist that knows magic really well, <laughs> is it easier to teach someone to be a data scientist or to teach them magic? <laughs> and it's like, screw it, bring in someone that knows magic. We can teach them to be a data scientist. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is really important. Can we just have a, a degree in magic so that we can just graduate <laughs> folks through the yeah. game first and then get some on-job skills? We need, we need five color universe. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm into it. I think we're out of time. I'm just gonna blurt out a couple of takeaways. Uh, I think we're saying that characters and worlds are important. Uh, their interactions and stories are also very important, uh, particularly if you want a very passionate community base. Uh, your world can be ever evolving and, and improved. Uh, we're, we're now seeing that with these intergenerational games. Uh, and you can create a robust world that matters with constraints. So, thank you. Thanks. Thank you.